Everyone has a story about the massive fish that got away. Some will say it's a fish that can't be caught. A fish that has been around for so long, it's uncatchable by any angler. But the truth is, for a fish to be around for so long, it may turn out that it isn't a fish at all. When I was younger, we lived in a nice suburban neighborhood outside St. Louis. I had lots of friends nearby, and there was a playground just down the street. But since my mom passed, my dad said we had to move for his new job at a small town in western Missouri. Welcome to... Mudwater, I read on a large sign as we drove into town. Gross, I said, making a face. Hey now, this town was popping back in the day. Evidently it was a popular stop for boats coming down the Missouri River. That's pretty cool, huh? Dad looked at me in the rearview mirror, but I shifted my gaze towards my younger brother Noah who still looked a little sick from the winding roads we just traveled on for the past hour. You going to make it? Dad joked as we started driving down Main Street. Out the window we could see storefronts with signs reading for sale, while others were simply boarded up. Of course, it may have been popping back in the day when there were bushwhackers and gorillas riding through these parts, and the main saloon was still in business, but people at the town hall have assured me that this town is up and coming and your old man is getting paid the big bucks to bring his big city tech to a small town. So liven up, this is a new experience for us. I rolled my eyes at him in the rearview mirror and looked out my window again to see us pulling into the driveway of an old house. This is it, our new home, Dad said, exiting the car with arms wide, turning back at us. There are bars on the windows and doors. It looks like a prison, I said, looking back at him. Yeah, a prison. Noah repeated. Oh, come on, this is a great new start. I bet there's kids down the street, and look. He walked down a hill alongside the back of the house and pointed at the backyard. Access to the town river, right in the backyard. I could teach you two how to fish. I've never seen you fish, I said, arms crossed. Well, that's because I haven't fished before, but how hard could it be? Get a fishing rod, some hooks, some worms, Dad said, wiggling his fingers back towards me. Ew, gross, I said between giggles, slapping his wormy fingers away from me. See, Dad said, turning back towards the house. We're going to have fun. Trust me. A few hours later, the moving truck finally reached our home, which brought with it the attention of the neighbors, and what seemed like most of the town. There were a few neighborhood kids, Travis Topher, a skinny kid with glasses who lived down the street on the left, as well as Kevin Crosby, who was just a year younger than me, and his younger sister Kelly Crosby, who always seemed to remind me of a blonde-haired doll I used to have, who lived a house down on the right. In between us and the Crosbys lived a lonely old man that looked something of a walking skeleton, who introduced himself as Mr. Merkin. Dad's new boss, the mayor, also showed up, who introduced himself as Mayor Marcus Walter, and said his family had lived in the town for over 150 years. He joked that we should batten down the hatches, as it evidently rains for a week straight every year this time of the month. We didn't see much of the other neighbors on the street, though they mostly seemed to be elderly, as we could sometimes catch them peeking out of the windows. We were all moved in by the end of the day, which was a relief, but at the same time, kind of strange to be laying in my bed at a different house. This uneasiness was quickly met with my lack of energy from moving boxes all day, which sent me straight to sleep. There was a knock in the middle of the night, followed by scratching against my window, as I noticed one of the tree branches brushing up against it in the midnight wind of the storm. I got up out of bed to inspect the sound closer when I noticed the silhouette of a figure standing on the deck from the house over. It was Mr. Merkin. He was looking back towards the river in his backyard, handcuffed around the flame of the candle so the wind could not blow it out. What was he doing? I thought to myself. But in that moment, he slowly began turning towards my window as I was grabbed around the waist. I let out a small shriek as I turned away from the window. Hannah! Noah said, looking up at me. This house is creepy. Can I sleep with you? First off, I said, pushing him away from me. Don't be creeping up on me in the dark or you're fixing to get your booger-faced lights knocked out. And second, yes, but only because you're scared and I'm not. Noah nodded his head in agreement and we crawled into bed, hopeful that this time we'd make it to morning. The next day, Dad made us breakfast. Pancakes and bacon, my favorite. That was quite a storm last night. You're sure you two will be fine here without me? Dad asked. 
Uh, yeah, Dad. We'll be fine. I mean, come on. I'm 13. School starts in a few weeks. It's really not that big of a deal. Okay, he said, tossing the frying pan into the sink. Well, stay out of trouble. And if you need anything, just walk down to the town hall, he said, as he picked up his laptop case and opened the front door. You know, you wouldn't have to worry so much if you just gave me a cell phone like any normal parent, I yelled out towards him. Dad smiled in response. Stay out of trouble, please, he said with a nod, then closed the door. Later that day, Travis, Kevin, and Kelly came over to the front porch to see what we were up to. What do you all do around here for fun? I asked. Oh, sometimes we play board games or play catch. We used to play my Xbox until I got grounded, Kevin said. You ever go down to the river? I spoke up, but all three of them fell silent, then locked eyes with each other and gulped. It was fairly apparent that they did not. Our parents said we weren't ever allowed to go down there, Travis said, pushing up his glasses. It's dangerous, Kevin added. How's it dangerous? Noah asked. Kelly spoke up. I heard someone died down there. Now they don't allow anyone to get close to the river. That's ridiculous, I said, standing up off the porch steps, putting on my rain boots. If we're careful, nothing is going to go wrong. I took off towards the back of the house towards the river with Noah, Travis, Kevin, and Kelly following in tow, lagging behind after putting on their mud boots, with most of them pleading me to turn back. With the river better in view, the pleading stopped, and so did I, by the feeling of a cold, bony hand gripping me by the shoulder. I turned around and jumped at the side of Mr. Merkin, shaking a bony finger at me. You shouldn't be down here. It's cursed, he said shakily. Everyone stood, mouths agape, and huddled behind me. Cursed, he said again. On the second mention, we all took off running. Ha! That old man's crazy, I said, giggling between breaths. It's true, though. This river's curse, Evan replied. No, it's not. That's just something they tell kids to keep them out of the places they don't want them to go. We ran through some trees into the forest where the ground began to get soggy and an unnatural fog crept above the ground. Ooh, spooky, I said, making a face towards the others. We should turn back, Kevin said. Yeah, come on, Hannah, we should go back, Noah repeated. Ah, uh, come on, Noah, not you two. You're just trying to scare us, I said as I waded into the shallow water and sat on a fallen tree. Look, we've been out here for like five minutes now, and nothing has happened to us. Everyone looked around worryingly, looking for a sign to be at ease, all except for Kelly whose eyes were locked on the fallen tree I was sitting on. You guys? Everyone stopped and looked at Kelly as my hand brushed over what felt like old rope tied around the log. That log has got gills. I looked down at the tree I sat on, and in that moment the tree shook. Eyes rose up above the water surface seeing us and with three giant tail flips bumped me off and swam for deeper water. Kevin rushed forward and pulled me up out of the water. See? It's a monster! Kevin yelled, rushing us all back to land. We ran as fast as we could to the edge of the forest, but it was only then that I noticed there were only four of us. Noah. How could I have forgotten my own brother? I yelled his name and started walking back into the trees. No! Kevin yelled as he pulled me back. I have to find my brother, I said, pulling against him to go back in. Please, we can go, but we need help. I looked him in the eyes for a moment and then sighed, realizing what needed to be done. We took off for town hall. Dad, I yelled, entering the building. Dad, I shouted again. The town hall looked old and was decorated with artwork and artifacts from the Civil War. In the entryway hung a large painting of Civil War soldiers, presented to Matthias M. Mudwater, Colonel, Southern States of America. What seems to be the problem, little missy? The mayor asked, startling me as he exited his office. Where's my dad? My brother? He's, he's missing. Noah's missing? My father asked, running into the room. What happened, and why are you soaked? I told them about the river and the tree that turned into a fish, which my dad couldn't believe, bringing his fingers to his forehead. No, stop, Hannah. I, I can't believe you. We have a new town, a new start, and already you're getting into trouble again. Except this time, you lost your brother. I looked at him in shock. I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's what really happened. Tell him, you guys. I looked at Travis, Kevin, and Kelly, and after a moment, Kevin took a step forward. It's true, sir. There's a monster out there, he said, looking at the mayor. Dad looked up at the mayor as well, who shared a very serious look. The mayor put his hands on his waist beneath his waistcoat 
and started walking towards a window in the other room, looking out towards the river. You knew about this? My father asked in shock. The mayor kept looking the other way. You knew about this, and yet you still invited me and my family to your town and let me move into that house? I, I can't believe this, he yelled, waving his arms frantically as he continued. Enough, the mayor finally said, turning around and slashing the air with his hand. Yes, I knew about it, and to tell you the truth, I wasn't worried about your family one bit. My dad's shocked face turned red with anger. But, the mayor continued, it is not because I did not care about you or your family. He paused for a moment and turned away again, looking back out the window. See, there's a witch in those woods. The emotion of anger was flooded with shock as my father rolled his eyes. Come on, a witch, he said. I'm not joking. That witch has been in those woods and that river for over a century. She's the reason this here town is dying. She won't let any boats make it up the river, and with the roads the way they are, well, you experienced it yourself. No one likes to make that drive. Dad was taken aback by the mayor's words. Kids, would you be able to show me where you saw the creature? The mayor asked, grabbing a gaff and an armful of harpoons off the wall. Yes, sir, Kevin responded, opening up the front door to the town hall. You're not serious, Mr. Mayor. A witch hunt? Dad said as the mayor walked by him out the door. It's the only way we're going to save this town, the mayor responded, throwing his weapons into the back of the truck. Now those harpoons, they have silver tips, and I've sharpened them like razors. If we find that there monster or the witch, we'll take care of them, he said as he sat in his truck. I'll round up the boys and meet you at your home in one hour, the mayor said as he tore out of the parking lot. I can't believe this, Dad said, looking at the rest of us. I started to walk down the town hall steps and turn around towards him. It's time to start believing. It took a lot for us not to look for Noah on our own, but following the mayor's guidance, we waited an hour and sure enough, he was at our drive with two other men, armed to hunt with gaffs, rope with giant hooks and harpoons in hand. It all seemed so surreal as we walked to the edge of the forest line. Monster hunting? Really? I thought to myself. I wonder what the other kids will say they did over summer break. The mayor and his goons took point, walking through the forest to reach the swampy river edge. Meanwhile, myself, Dad, Kevin, Travis, and Kelly, as well as their parents, the Tophers and the Crosbys, took up the rear, yelling for Noah. We wandered along the edge of the river, shouting Noah's name as the sun began to sink low and dark clouds moved towards us. It's getting late, and a storm's rolling in, Dad shouted to the mayor. Noah must be so worried, he muttered to himself. The mayor raised a lantern to his face and shouted back, Why don't y'all circle back? Me and the boys will keep searching. Its glossy scales reflect light, which makes it easier to see at night. Dad nodded as we turned and started shouting Noah's name again. We'll find him, Dad. I know we will, I said, looking at him smiling. Deep down, I knew it was my fault. If I had never wanted to see the river, we never would have been in this mess. Before long, we were back at the edge of the forest. Dad turned around to all of us, shining the light of the lantern in the dark. Hey, I just want to thank you all. I know we're new in town, and you didn't have to help us find my son, but you did, and I really appreciate it. Mr. Crosby pulled Mrs. Crosby in closer and said, Hey, that's what being a good neighbor is all about in a small town. We all need to stick together. That comment brought a smile to Dad and my face as we looked at each other and back at all of them. Except, there was something strange. There were four parents, but why were there four kids? I stepped towards the shorter kids with my lantern. Travis? Kelly? Noah? I shouted. How did we not notice him following us? I said, looking at the others as Dad rushed over. Noah's eyes were pure white, as if his eyes were rolled to the back of his head. Noah! Dad said, shaking him. Noah, it's Dad! He's breathing, but he's not answering me. I took a few steps back from Noah, but lost my footing and fell backwards, only to be caught mid-fall. Two bony hands held me up as I turned around, shocked to see Mr. Merkin's skeletal face in the light of my lantern. I told you, kids, this forest is cursed, he said. Mr. Merkin... Why is the forest curse? What is the connection with the river? Dad said, holding both me and Noah in his arms. Mr. Merkin looked down at Noah, then looked back up at us. It happened nearly 150 years ago to this day. The end of the Civil War birthed a new enemy here in the South, those that didn't want the war to end. 
Slaves were freed in Missouri, but many people wanted things the way they once were. And those that put up a resistance to the ruffians were cut down, or more accurately, hanged up. I looked up at my dad, who looked back at me, understanding Mr. Merkin's words. Miriam, my love, was one of those freed slaves who pushed back against the agitators. She was strong, motivated by Miriam, wouldn't take anything from anybody. Much like you, Mr. Merkin said, raising a finger towards me. I loved her, and together we married, ready to create a better life. But then, on her way back from the market one evening, she was taken by riders into the forest. I tried to follow, but the storm that night kept me from going any further. And ever since, dark rain clouds have fallen over this town every year on this very week. I believe my Miriam cursed the town and all those in it, including myself, destroying the river boats and killing anyone related to those Civil War soldiers who ever got near the river, he shouted. But sir, that would make you over 150 years old. How is it no one has noticed you being alive all this time? My dad asked. Mr. Merkin closed his mouth and stood up straight again. Getting old is a terrible thing. You remember so much, then some days you remember so little. Friends die, families move, and that old man down the street always appears to be old, no matter how many years you've seen him. At some point, people always stop asking me about my health and start talking about the weather instead. The Crosbys and the Tophers stood up straight, looking down in embarrassment at his answer. But what about my son? Dad asked. Mr. Merkin walked closer to Noah, then looked back up at both of us as lightning struck in the night sky. For many years in my youth, I walked that force, searching for where they hanged my Miriam. And after many years, the trip became too much for my old bones. But with your help and last night's storm, we may be able to finally find her. Break this curse and save your son. I looked around towards everyone else, then back to Mr. Merkin. Let's find your wife. With Dad and I holding Mr. Merkin by both arms and Mr. Crosby holding a lantern behind us, we made our way back through the forest as the other kids and parents stayed with Noah. A blood-curdling yell filled the night sky. That way, Mr. Merkin shouted, pointing. Another yell rang out, followed by what sounded like the mayor shouting in fury. We hurried in the forest in the direction of the mayor's shouting, where we reached the water's edge and began wading through. The trees, Mr. Merkin pointed out. They're blocking the river's current. We continued wading downstream through the river just above knee-high when we saw what appeared to be the silhouette of someone standing alone in the dark, but upon further inspection, it was wood with tattered cloth. We continued forward towards the yelling of our mare where we saw yet another, except this time the shape was too noticeable. This wood log was holding what appeared to be a harpoon, and the silver tip was still intact. My god. Miriam, Mr. Merkin uttered as he looked forward to a lantern swaying back and forth. As it began to rain, we could make out the mare kneeling down with his harpoon beside him, holding his lantern and swinging his gaff wildly at the river water below him. He was balancing on what appeared to be a fallen tree just above the water level, with a rope tied to a branch leading beneath the river's surface. We stopped and looked at each other, all knowing what we had found. Mr. Merkin, gathering what strength he had, shook himself loose from our grip and began wading towards the tree. The mayor looked up at us in a manic state. I've got her, Grandpa! She's here! The monster's here! But in that moment, the jaws of the enormous fish leapt out of the depths of the river and clamped hold of the mayor's head, with sharpened teeth piercing his skin and rotating against his neck like the teeth of a saw. The mayor's head was ripped clean from his body as the expression of shock on his face sank below the surface of the river. Grandpa, I repeated, looking back at my dad and Mr. Crosby. The mayor's body stayed knelt in place as his skin turned dark and dry, growing bark and moss, becoming a part of the tree he knelt on. Miriam, Mr. Merkin shouted as he waded ever closer to the tree. It's me, Matthias, your husband, Miriam. And with that, the rope began to move in Mr. Merkin's direction, turning from a dirty brown to a glowing spectral green as it rose out of the water. Matthias? I repeated to myself. Matthias M. Mudwater, I muttered, recalling the painting from the town hall. Matthias Merkin Mudwater, the original founder of the town. I've searched ages for you, my love. 
searching for you, to give you the burial you deserve. It's just this river, the flood, I couldn't find you. Mr. Merkin looked down and reached his bony hand into the river, revealing a human skull. I never knew the water would carry away that chair, my love, Mr. Merkin said, reaching out to hand me the skull. I reached my hands out for it as Mr. Merkin said, I just wanted to show you how I couldn't live without you, or more so how you couldn't live without me. An evil grin came over his face as he dropped the skull into my hands. There was a flash of light before a vision appeared. I could see Matthias Mudwater on top of his horse, surrounded by two other men draped in white besides a tree next to the river. I will never love you, Miriam screamed as she spit at him. I must insist, Miriam. Your games have gone on for far too long. Perhaps a night alone is what you need to quit fighting my advances. The two other men burst out in laughter as thunder broke out. Oh, and hopefully a little rain doesn't make you melt, you witch. In an instant, time sped by. The men rode off, the storm rolled in, the river flooded and Miriam met her fate as another flash of light revealed the tree as it is today. I was in an utter state of shock as Mr. Merkin's face shifted from a grin to concern in reaction to my expression. But that was when I noticed the unnatural glow growing stronger behind him. With one swift movement, the fish darted forward, clamping down on Mr. Merkin's head like his grandson the mare before him. My love, Mr. Merkin gasped out with his final breath as his head was ripped clean from his shoulders and body turned to wood. The wind howled as the storm grew ever stronger. Hannah, we've got to get out of here, Dad yelled at me as I looked down at Miriam's skull. No, I shook my head back at him as I looked towards the harpoon stabbed into the tree in front of us. I waded as fast as I could to the harpoon, pulling myself up by the mare's wooden body and began slashing away at the rope with the harpoon as best I could. It was at this moment that I noticed the rope changing direction, heading straight towards my dad. Tears filled my eyes as I screamed in fury, cutting the rope as fast as I could until the rope went taut. Dad! I yelled, looking back in fear, but the creature was there floating, biting wildly a foot in front of Mr. Crosby's face. The rope had tangled around all of her wooden victims. Cut faster, Dad yelled as I resumed cutting. Hearing the creature's jaws snapping wildly towards them, the blades of the harpoon cut deeper and deeper into the old rope until at last the final strand had been cut. The knotted rope hit the water's surface as the storm came to a stop and gently drifted downstream. I looked back towards my father but was met with a familiar spectral face, the face from my vision, Miriam. She looked at me from head to toe and nodded as she ran her hands through her tightly braided hair. Thank you, she said, as her spectral figure floated up, vanishing into the star-filled night sky as the storm clouds resumed their shape. The storm followed through that night and cleared out the fallen trees. Engineers visited the town to inspect the river and said it was the healthiest the river had looked for the past century. The moment Miriam's ghost vanished, our friend Saint Noah exited his trance claiming he was never lost, but had a conversation with a nice lady in the woods, even if he never saw her, and was then being shown the way back to his family. We buried Miriam's skull and gave her a proper funeral. All in all, Dad was right. Life is looking better in Mudwater. It's been a full year since our experience with Miriam, and I think things are looking pretty good. However, I have noticed this week the storm clouds are rolling in again, but I'm sure it's just a coincidence.